art that's political and unsettling, and that's also supposed to be fun. Founded in 1955, the Documenta is widely seen as the most important international contemporary art exhibition. Held every five years, the world's best and most compelling artists are invited to exhibit their work here. But this year's event was different. Very few big names, lots of collectives from countries that barely have an art market, and art intended to make the world a better place. Sounds great, right? So what else was in store for visitors? I didn't expect overt classic anti-Semitism. These are the masterminds of Documenta 15. The Ruan Grupa Art Collective is legendary in Indonesia. It was conceived more than 20 years ago in the capital, Jakarta, not long after Suharto's dictatorship ended. The country was reeling. Ruan Grupa wanted to try something new, to network artists and foster mutual support. That's what the group continues to do today, organizing exhibitions and festivals based on the idea that art should be relevant to the society in which it is created and that the collective is more important than the individual. Kassel's Kunsthalle Friedrichsianum is the Documenta's main venue. Putting a radical Asian artists collective in charge of curating this year's event was always going to be a divisive decision. Many welcomed it, but there were also concerns. Would Documenta 15 take aim at Western societies, at their lifestyles, at the art market? We come here uh, as a collective coming from a context of uh, Indonesia, which is always called Global South. Uh, we don't come here to change, but we come here to bring the best, what we consider the best from our practice. The reason why from Rupa can sustain for 22 years is the practice that we also try to bring here with some improvisation because it's uh, in a different context. And then, uh, and then what we hope, our expectation is actually that uh, after Documenta 15, we want to keep on experimenting the way to sharing resources and working together uh, in order to sustain together also. Ruan Grupa and its international team of advisors are committed to art that's not produced for a market, that aims to have an impact on society, and that knows no stars and no hierarchies. The collective sees its task at Documenta not to curate, but to invite artists with similar approaches to their work. We don't commission works. We don't ask, we don't use the classical approach or conventional approach of curating. It's because Ruang Rupa, we are, we, none of us were uh, trained as a curator. Uh, none of us were trained as a curator. Uh, so the way, the, 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 the if, it, if people call us curator, uh, we don't criticize, but we never call ourselves as a curators. A fresh, groundbreaking approach. If only it weren't for the anti-Semitism accusations against the Rwan Grupa Collective that emerged months before the official opening, as well as allegations that some of its members supported the anti-Israeli BDS movement and complaints that no Israeli but several Palestinian artists were invited. In Kassel and in Berlin, the issue was initially played down, with management implying there was nothing to the claims. Documenta's organizers insisted they understood Germany's special responsibility regarding the issue of anti-Semitism. We take Germany's responsibility very seriously, and we are addressing it, and the artists here have also been dealing with it very closely. But the entire approach of this documenta is directed towards the future, and that is why this preoccupation with Germany's past has simply not been front and center. The opening in June 2022 was a major event. So was all the fuss forgotten? Until the very last minute, the artists of the Indonesian Taring Padi Collective were working on their cardboard figures on the central Friedrichsplatz, where, shortly after the official opening, the 9 by 12 meter People's Justice banner was to be hung. 
When it was finally unveiled, a scandal erupted. A 20-year-old work recalling the former Indonesian President Suharto's reign of terror, as well as the regime's international helpers, such as the Israeli Secret Service. And this was depicted with the worst imaginable anti-Semitic stereotypes. A soldier with a pig's face, and an Orthodox Jew with fangs and SS ruins on his hat. There was an outcry. First, the artists covered up the large format picture. That didn't solve the problem. Two days later, the banner was removed and the huge frame dismantled. We were shocked that what we have experienced in developing countries could also happen in developed countries. It means that there is no difference in how people look at a work of art. When there is a sensitive issue, there is no dialogue or anything else. The artwork is simply dismantled. Documenta had the very anti-Semitism debate on its hands it had explicitly been warned about. The international press took note. But still, no one took responsibility. The public was horrified. How could this happen in the country that had murdered millions of European Jews, where preventing all forms of anti-Semitism is a raison d'etat? The president of the Central Council of Jews in Germany was appalled. For me, anti-Semitism is inhumane no matter whether in Indonesia or Germany. Of course, anti-Jewish, anti-Israeli stereotypes are sadly common in some countries. In a country like Germany, with its history and its responsibility, this should never be allowed. Promoting anti-Semitism in art exhibitions with state with tax money is not acceptable. Israeli-German Meron Mendel deals with this issue professionally. As director of the Anne Frank Educational Center in Frankfurt, it's his job to mediate and promote dialogue. He offered to serve as an advisor to help the Documenta identify other anti-Semitic works. This is a shambles, and all we can do is look ahead. Sure, the time will come when we'll need to look at what went wrong, but now we need to take a constructive approach and ensure we look at the problematic artworks that are still there very closely. But that's precisely what, for weeks, no one seemed interested in doing. The Documenta's board went missing in action, even when more works were deemed to be anti-Semitic. For instance, Guernica Gaza, a series of paintings by Palestinian artist Mohammed al-Hawajri, copies of photos of Israeli soldiers in the style of the old masters. The pictures themselves are more anti-Israeli than anti-Semitic. But the series title, Guernica Gaza, equates the destruction of the Basque town of Guernica by the German Luftwaffe in 1937 with Israeli settlement policy. Such distortions may serve the narrative of Palestinian extremists. Then, in an exhibition mounted by an Algerian women's archive, a brochure with drawings showing Israeli soldiers threatening a child was found. Is it anti-Semitic too? The documenta says, no, but an explanatory text is now placed alongside it. In it, the collective explains that they're historical documents and that criticism of the Israeli occupation is not synonymous with anti-Semitism. In another exhibition space, the artist's collective Subversive Film shows pro-Palestinian propaganda films from the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, films that depict Israel and its military solely as aggressors. Nowhere does it say who produced these films. Five years ago, you couldn't even have imagined something like this. Now, though, you hear such things more and more often. And I think it's very important that society, politicians, the media and culture itself 
put up some resistance. Imagine the documenta is still today giving voice to Palestinian terrorists on a loop in a country marking the 50th anniversary of the Munich Olympics massacre. In no way can I accept letting Palestinian terrorists speak. The resulting public pressure forced the head of the documenta to resign and an interim general manager took over, Alexander Fahrenholz, who'd managed the art exhibition 30 years ago. But he too didn't want to take down or remove anything, preferring to leave the decision about what was anti-Semitic to a newly formed advisory board. The only thing we can all agree on very quickly is that anti-Semitism has no place at a documenta. But what that means now is precisely the point that's being debated. And I think this part of the debate is very productive because it's also taking place within the Jewish community. Nonetheless, it is so, and I notice this in personal discussions too, that in the Jewish community, people feel distressed or even hurt by the occurrences which have taken place in Kassel, and that's keeping them from visiting Kassel. The challenges of appointing a collective of artistic directors who don't define themselves as curators had become clear. Ade Damawan publicly apologized in the name of Ruangrupa, yet didn't accept responsibility. The collective believes Germans' sensitivities blew the matter up into an anti-Semitism scandal. The artists from the collective Taring Party fear for their reputation. They're still being criticized in the media, on Twitter, and elsewhere. In the Indonesian cultural scene, the issue of anti-Semitism is rarely mentioned. So we don't know in detail exactly what the issue is, or if there is a specific law in Germany about this. Because we are Indonesians, we don't know in detail what the issue is. What we're alluding to is state violence. We can say unequivocally that Taring Padi is not anti-Semitic. Taring Padi is always open to diversity because that is a human right. And it's exactly what the members of Taring Padi have been fighting for over the past two decades. Human rights, the recognition of religious and ethnic minorities, more democracy and freedom of expression, and against racism. They see themselves as artists, but also as activists. They feel the accusations of anti-Semitism are an attack on their whole identity. The Documenta set out to open a dialogue between the Global South and the Global North. But is such a dialogue even possible now? I think that this juxtaposition of North and South is sometimes an oversimplification that overlooks many nuances. Having a dialogue also means accepting and appreciating the values of the other by listening. And that won't work if Indonesians come here and say, this is how it is, take it or leave it. Just as it won't work the other way around, by wagging a finger at them and saying, do this or get out. It will only work out if there is a willingness on both sides to listen to each other. How anti-Semitic is the Documenta? That's what the expert panel was tasked with finding out. Its statement, published two weeks before the end of the show, was devastating, both for Ruan Grupa and for the exhibition's decision makers. It becomes clear that the serious problems of the Documenta 15 consist not only in the presentation of isolated works with anti-Semitic imagery and statements, but also in a curatorial and organizational structural environment that has allowed an anti-Zionist, anti-Semitic, and anti-Israel sentiment. The experts called for immediate action and an instant stop to the showing of Palestinian propaganda films.
The debate made it look like most of the works on display are anti-Semitic. As a result, many artists feel they have wrongly been cast under a cloud of suspicion. There are said to be around 1,500 artists and activists at the Documenta. But there might be even more than that, since the artists and collectives invited, in turn, invited others. Romanian artist Don Perjovski is one of the few internationally known participants. In front of Castle's main train station, he produces his daily horizontal newspaper, featuring drawings and texts on the state of the world and the latest from the Documenta. It inevitably leads to conversations with passers-by. That's how he sees the role of art, taking a stand and having an impact on society. It's what he did while living under Ceausescu's communist regime in Romania, before its collapse in 1989. As an artist who's exhibited in the world's leading museums, how does he see his role at this year's Documenta? I'm a good translator between these worlds, the global south and the western world, because I do not belong to any. Of course, my, my training is western, you know, art history, boys, whatever. But I also learned from them, from other parts of the world. I was in Australia, I was in Asia, Asia a lot. Uh, so I learned other points of view. So I, can, I think I can do the bridge. And I think probably this is one of the reasons I got invited here. Dan Pajowski's main work at the Documenta 15 can be seen on the columns of the Friedericiano, a building dating back to the 18th century and the nucleus of the whole show. Again, comments and cartoon-like drawings meant to illustrate the values of this year's exhibition. Don Pajowski applauds Ruan Grupa for introducing the idea of a mutually supportive art scene to the Documenta. Actually, they show to everybody a vision of the world from another point of the world, you know. So, you know, it, it is known as the document of collectiveness and cooperation, which is true, which is true. This is how these people are living in their countries. There's no art market there. So you have to, you resist economically if you are in a, in a network or group and you do workshops and, you know, and sell a T-shirt and, you know, so you have to invent an economy to exist. So, and I think they teach us very well now because the winter is coming here, right? The money will go to Panzer, no? So the culture budget will be cut, so we have to collaborate. Don Perjovsky shrugs off the suggestion that the document of 15 was overshadowed by a debate, a scandal about anti-Semitism. This is just in the media, there's no scandal here. Come and visit. Obviously, the scandal is unsettling. The artists don't want it to eclipse their message. Only a few meters from the Friedericianum, a tunnel leads to the exhibition of the Kenyan collective Wajuku Art Project. The work is displayed in a room modeled on a corrugated iron hut. Wajuku Art Project was founded in 2004. In a slum near Nairobi, the collective offers children and young people a space to learn and creates jobs in the community with the production and sale of its artworks. As you can see, the walls of Documenta Hall have been changed. And uh, with this, our idea is to tell our stories, people to hear the stories from us. Uh, most of the time, the story you hear about the slum is the negative story about crime, drugs, our art as artists in the slum, we changed that. And this is the story we want to bring here. Our strength, our hope, and our beauty. This is what we want to tell. To meet with Russian artist Victoria Lomasko, we have to cross town. The residential area of Bettenhausen is not necessarily where you would expect to find art. The Catholic Church of St. Cunigundis has stood empty for years. During the Documenta 15, it hosts macabre-looking multimedia sculptures by the Haitian collective Atis Resistance, representing Christian figures of saints, some with human skulls that evoke voodoo rituals. 
Victoria Lamasco wanted to meet us here because she's fascinated by these figures. In the churchyard, she shows us the works she made during the Documenta 15. Lamasco refers to herself as a graphic journalist, and in Russia, her drawings have always been critical of Putin's politics. She fled her home at the beginning of the Ukraine war. In Castle, she calls herself a harvester, recording her observations and conversations. My goal is not uh, to find uh, something uh, provocative as uh, an ordinary journalist, but uh, to think uh, how to support each other and how to share our experience. And uh, it's a big challenge for me uh, to talk in English uh, with uh, artists uh, from Indonesian, from many Arabic countries, from African countries. At this moment, uh, I uh, know the, that I really can tell the story. Uh, in American, uh, of course, society, she also asked questions about the anti-Semitism uh, debate in her talks with fellow artists. I understand the situation. I, when uh, I tried to ask someone, uh, in, anyone uh, answer something like this, you know, we don't want uh, problems. We realize it's absolutely taboo in Germany. So just they themselves uh, speak about this. Many of the artists she has met with come from a different cultural background and offer a different take on the debate. Her own story, her fear of reprisals or even arrest, has not been a theme of her work here. But it might be once the documenta is over. Alice Yard, a self-described art and performance space network, was founded in 2006. The Yard is traditionally a space where neighbors and residents gather, which anyone can use. Alice Yard picks up on this tradition. A couple of artist friends started out by setting up a kind of artist's workshop, a space to make contacts and find inspiration from one another. Kristen Chen found his way to the group when he returned to Port of Spain after studying design in the United States. For me, though, as a person who has a practice, you know, was in search of a space, um, it kind of arrived and became, you know, something that I don't know if I chose, but it was present and it was something that I had access to um, and allowed me to also be able to have conversations and, and work with um, other artists that I did not know when I when I moved back home after my education, um, so it, it 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 quickly became you know a network of um, of of creatives. Trinidad is the southernmost island of the West Indies and home to many immigrants and many descendants of former slaves, so colonialism and its effects have always been a major topic. Making art here is a challenge. The international art market has tended to overlook Trinidad. The invitation to the Documenta came as a complete surprise to Christopher Cozier, an artist and founding member of Alice Yard. You know, when I was an art student as a young person in the U.S., you know, Documenta was something that sort of grim, um, you know, sort of white males with grumpy faces did somewhere in the world, you know, and as a brown body, I could at best be an eloquent voyeur, but not actually participate in this conversation. The Alice Yard artists exhibit their works, appropriately enough, in a yard behind a bar in Castle. And they've invited artists from their network to join them here. One is performance artist Louis Vasquez Laroche, who's brought to Germany traditions from the Caribbean carnivals that are deeply rooted in Trinidad's own colonial history. The crack of the whip here serves to parody the cruel slave driver. The Documenta is not so much the place to enhance one's market value as to exchange ideas with other artists by interpreting themes close to their hearts and minds. That's what the Alice Yard artists are enjoying most. Why waste your life, you know, trying to be part of something that is already designed to exclude you, um, you know, historically or currently, whether it's economics or, or, or history. So I said, okay, well, we are doing this little thing here in Port of Spain and we are fascinated to know that there are other people doing little things elsewhere and the thing becomes a big thing 
when we kind of start talking to each other and sharing ideas, and that's really been fascinating. Dino Sukverte hasn't come to the Documenta as an artist, but as a member of a research collective offering education in the arts in Africa. Another Roadmap Africa cluster is a network of activists dedicated to illuminating the continent's colonial history. Many stories, languages, and even identities have been defined by the former colonial powers. One of our key interests is dealing with our colonial ghosts, as we call them. This is something that basically brings us all together. And because there are so many complexities that come with the residue of coloniality on the continent, we're trying still to see how to activate archives, explore history, uh, pave ways forward through that, even our own understanding of self as members within the collective. The Documenta offers an opportunity for this collective from various African countries to continue their school textbook project. Workshops where these topics are discussed are open to the public. Sokfete is only saddened that discussions at the Documenta 15 have been overshadowed by the anti-Semitism issue. It has been a huge part of, of Documenta 15. There was no way of escaping it. But I don't know if I want to speak too much on that because it's such a loaded topic. And personally, I feel like this is a more internal thing and I'm a visitor here. And therefore, I really like, yeah. I mean, I sympathize with some of the things that have been said on both sides. People have experienced violence, and there are a lot of feelings. It's grounds to have an honest and open conversation, but that's going to be a difficult conversation. And I wonder if all the parties involved are ready for that moment yet of being honest and genuine about it. With artists from many parts of the world that are rarely represented in the art world, the Documenta 15 brings together political art and traditional art, art by ethnic groups that might never hang in a museum. Hundreds of thousands of visitors don't want to miss the opportunity to see it. The Documenta's interim managing director already sees the exhibition as a success that will resonate. I don't think there have been many such milestones in the Documenta's history. A milestone? Rwan Grupa's approach may indeed resonate in the long term. Their efforts to network artists and support local communities could meet with some success or even eventually change concepts of art. But in their task as curators, they undoubtedly failed. Either overlooking blatant anti-Semitism or redefining it as artistic freedom is reckless at best. In an open letter, Ruan Grupa, along with other Documenta artists, rejected the experts' criticism. We are angry, we are sad, we are tired, we are united. The Documenta began with a good idea, but ended in irreconcilable differences. The dialogue between the Global South and the Global North that was supposed to take place barely got started. And as an institution, it's been seriously damaged. Some critics are even wondering if Germany's most renowned art exhibition can survive. It needs a reboot for sure, with a new team that takes the curator's task seriously, and will have to prove that the message that shook the art world to its core has been received and understood. Does the Documenta need a reboot? What do you think? <laughs>